As a kid growing up, I thought of New York as big. It was well known throughout the United States, throughout the world, because it was older. So my thoughts of New York City was, wow, if I go there someday, it's going to be huge. I'm going to get lost. And that's how I thought of it as a kid. For a long time, I never wanted to go back to New York. I would like to go back now and, and visit the memorial. And I, I want to share that with my family. I thought of New York as being the Big Apple, the place where the financial district is at. I thought of New York as being the home of the Yankees. New York was a place that I wanted to go, uh, and I haven't been back since. Life is short. Life is short. We certainly don't get enough years of life, and some of us get uh, quite a few less than we deserve. New York City. In 1966, work begins on a construction project developed by the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey to build two identical 110-story skyscrapers in Lower Manhattan. Twin towers that would become the tallest buildings ever built. Each tower would have an acre of office space per floor, 22,000 windows, and panoramic views of more than 60 miles. The towers were officially dedicated in April 1973, and over the ensuing 28 years would become two of the most photographed and recognizable structures on Earth. But nothing prepared us for what would happen next on the morning that changed the world. Mr. Roker, Al, it is such a pretty morning, it isn't is it? It's a perfect fall morning here. Yeah. Although it's not fall yet, so <laughs> it's still a perfect summer morning. And a good advice. Miles and miles of sunshine. Other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We like quiet. It's quiet. It's too quiet. Really a splendid September day. The afternoon temperature about 80 degrees. Great weather for the primary election. Tonight, clear and cool. Well, currently winds out of the northwest at 6 miles per hour. Relative humidity 70%. 66 in Newark, 64 degrees in Bridgeport. 67 in Midtown and heading for 80.
I was on duty uh, at the end of my shift at Fire Station 6 here in Riverside. And when we woke up, we turned on the news at about 6 o'clock in the morning, getting off duty. Uh, I left work and I got a phone call to begin preparing uh, to mobilize the task force and prepare for the deployment. I was just finishing my 24-hour shift as a battalion chief covering Battalion 1. I received a phone call from one of my captains asking me if I had the television on. And I said no, and he said, you need to turn it on. You need to see this. And that's when I first realized that there was a major, major incident. And then the second plane hit the building. We knew at that point that we were going to be activated and respond to New York City as a, as a uh, FEMA USAR team. He called me a couple hours later. I was at work. He said, I'm going. And I said, you're going where? And he said, to New York. I was afraid. My heart sunk. Not only was I concerned about everything, the, the airplanes and all of the building collapse and everything that was going on in New York, I had to let my husband go there, which was very difficult. I was kind of shocked sitting in a chair watching airplanes fly into buildings. I mean, that's just not a normal thing. And dispatch called me from the fire, because dispatch is the one that gets the calls from California. Actually, the calls go from FEMA to California, California to the department. You're activated. The process started, there's a call out process that the dispatchers go through to get the members moving to the predetermined location where we're gonna respond from. And I remember walking out my front door, down my front steps, thinking to myself, I'm not coming home tonight. I'm gonna be gone for a long time. As a accounting tech for the City of Riverside Fire Department, the Urban Search and Rescue Division, uh, my job consists of response and readiness management for the California Task Force 6 Urban Search and Rescue Division. The City of Riverside Fire Department and the City of Riverside is the sponsoring agency for California Task Force 6. There are 28 sponsoring agencies for 28 teams in the nation that are Urban Search and Rescue National DHS FEMA program teams. The bulk of my job hap is happening right now. Once we get to New York City, that's when the rescue specialists and everyone else goes into action. To get uh, 80,000 pounds of equipment uh, to March Air Force Base in six hours is extremely hectic. Um, it took all 60 personnel and on-duty staff to assist us with filling boxes with equipment, um, loading the pallets correctly, netting the pallets, putting them on a 18-wheeler, getting the police department to escort us to, to, um, to March Air Force Base, making sure that all the pallets um, were put on the aircraft, um, that the invoices were done correctly. It was extremely hectic and extremely stressful. They had to load every little, every crate on the pallets. Um, it was backbreaking work. <laughs> you know, I, it, people could have got hurt before we even left Riverside. You know, I mean, some of this stuff is pretty big. And, and then when we got to the site, we had to unload it. You got the people, you got to trust your people. And the people, we had six hours to get out of Station 3 and get to March, and we did it. And I knew we were going to do it. As my role as safety officer, I'm really thinking ahead. I'm like way ahead. In a briefing we got, we were told to expect 50,000 casualties and 100 square blocks of damage. How are we going to do we haven't had casualties like this since the Civil War, one, at one single time. My family's incredibly important to me. And with this job, sadly, it took me away from family a lot. You know, working 24-hour shifts and sometimes going on campaign fires, you're gone for weeks 
at a time. When we got the phone call that they were, um, Task Force 6 was being activated, we um, I went and picked up my boys. Um, my oldest was in football at the time, uh, middle school football. And we picked them up and grabbed dinner and came down here to Riverside so that they could say goodbye to their dad and hug him and kiss him. And I remember driving home and just thinking that, um, just praying to send them out. There was a huge sense of, um, honor and pride in 9-11 was probably the first time I can remember actually being worried. Because um, I was in seventh grade in 9-11. So before that, I knew what dad did. You know, he was a firefighter. I was very proud of that. Um, but I never really thought much about the fact that he might not come home. Um, so 9-11 was probably the first time that I actually remember worrying about that. It was always, well, he's off helping somebody else in their emergency. But it also set a legacy, you know, of character for me and my brother and my sister. Each tower is struck by Boeing 767 airliners. Both planes are in flight from Boston to Los Angeles and carry not quite 10,000 gallons of jet fuel apiece, well shy of their 23,000 plus gallon tanks. The towers are struck with extraordinary force. American Airlines Flight 11 penetrates the North Tower, World Trade Center 1, at 429 miles per hour, between floors 94 and 99. There are 81 on board. The South Tower, World Trade Center 2, is struck by United Airlines Flight 175 at 535 miles per hour, between floors 78 and 84. There are 65 on board. Speed data is from an analysis by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. At 535 miles per hour, United Airline Flight 175 was near its breakup speed at that altitude, less than 1,000 feet, meaning it could have fractured in midair. The landing speed of each plane is approximately 170 miles per hour. There were no survivors above the impact zone in the North Tower and only 18 in the South Tower. Fires burned at 1,600 to 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And more than 90 countries will lose citizens in the attacks. Plane debris is scattered on streets and rooftops below. More than 2,700 people perish in New York City, 415 of which are first responders and state officials including 343 FDNY firefighters. We all knew that we were going to something that was historic and going to be awful. The training will take over, so you're ready. The pilot of the plane addressed us. He thanked us for the duty and service that we were about to do. And there's something unique about a military person who puts their life on the line to protect our country, to pay their respects to us and thank us. We were one of three airplanes in the sky, and the three airplanes were all task forces coming from California. Um, there was two of us out of March, LA City Fire and us, and one from Northern California, and we all had fighter jet escorts. Um, once we got to New Jersey, I was thinking, well, how do we get this 80,000 pounds of uh, pallets? How do we transport it? How do we move? The pallets has all of our equipment on it. It has everything. So we started putting plans in place um, to get f flatbed trucks in, in New Jersey um, to transport us eventually to New York City. When you have a full Type 1 team deploy, whether it's by land or air, the cash equipment that goes with it is very large. The approved cash list from FEMA and the USAR branch is over 5,000 um, item list, which can be uh, three tractor trailers full of equipment for all the disciplines, 
um, and multiple vehicles that transport the personnel and any other additional equipment. We, we leave um, New Jersey, so we go to the Jacob Javits uh, Convention Center, um, and that's where we set up our base of operations. Well, whenever a USAR team is deployed, one of the things that we need to do is find a place to accommodate our folks. We have a lot of equipment we bring in. We have a lot of people we bring in. One of the best locations in, in New York was the Javits Center, and that, that location really is what we call our base of operations. That's sort of home base. That's where our main place that we operate out of and manage the whole team. And then we get into Javits, and it was, it was a mad rush because Javits Center, where they decided to host us, was, was, it was convention center, so they had a convention going, so they had to clear out all those folks and their booths and make room for us. And we got there and that was still in the process of being done. Task Force 6 lands at McGuire Air Force Base in the early hours of the 12th, catches sleep, grabs a bite to eat, and heads to the Jacob Javits Convention Center to unload equipment and attend meetings and planning sessions for their first scheduled search and rescue assignment the following day. What they see when they arrive at the site is hard to describe. The ravaged landscape, towering piles of smoldering twisted steel and the gutted and charred remains of outer buildings are spread over 16 acres and is unsettling at best. Dust and soot remove the color from their world. Fires would burn for 99 days. It is a visage that none of them will ever forget. It was, it was enormous. I've never imagined being on a collapse structure of that size and to see the magnitude was overwhelming. Where do we even start? The enormity of the, the catastrophe was so immense. It's like, where do you even start to pick apart this pile to start looking? I remember walking down, and I don't remember what street it was, right close by, and seeing steel pieces sticking out of the street. Now, you don't see pieces of a building, steel beam, I-beam sticking out of a street. That's just not normal. That's a movie thing. But it was real. It's where we walk into literally burning hell. And everything was on fire. Smoking. Everything around us was on fire. Everything. I think about the first moments walking into that massive piece of destruction and just being completely in awe at, at the enormity of, of the disaster. I peeked down one of the streets, I can't remember which one it was, and I saw the pile for the first time, my, my small glimpse of the pile for the first time, and I realized to myself that this is gonna be something of a magnitude I've never, we have never seen before. At any moment, he could go on a call and he could you know, maybe not come home, uh, get hurt. Um, you don't really get used to it. You just learn to deal with it. And you trust in their training to get them through and get them back home to you. Try not to think about the what ifs. The thought of all the people that were either on the building, in the building, or around the building and how anybody would have possibly survived. We need to be very close to the incident. We need to bring all our tools and, 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 and resources close to the incident itself. So when we were in New York, we set up what we called a forward base of operations. And it really is sort of the operational people with their equipment and uh, close by. You're, you have your base back at the Javits, but you gotta have your equipment closer. So you have a base of operation closer to the site where you're working. So the guys started looking around. You have to realize during an emergency incident, there, there are no rules. 
So we scoured the area. Uh, we found a gym. Um, we, we forced entry into the gym. So we commandeered a, a um, fitness center and then use that as our forward base of operations so we can immediately deploy quickly to the pile and assist when needed. It had all glass windows and inside we had a, a hot plate, a microwave that we liberated from an office building. And our role basically is to give advice uh, on, on whenever it's needed, uh, structural advice. As a rescue specialist, uh, we are trained in uh, breaching, breaking, moving heavy objects uh, for the purpose of rescue, coordinated with search teams and canine rescue teams. I was in charge of two rescue squads. My job was to receive assignments from the task force leader or the command staff, and then I was uh, to um, task that out to my squads. My primary role is to care for the team. However, we have training in confined space rescue. But my primary goal is to, is to make sure the team stays healthy. Our job is to make sure that our team can communicate with each other and with other rescue teams. It's not just putting up an antenna, but you have to know where to put it up. As a medical specialist, the job function is to take care of the task force members that are working on the pile or in the area of the disaster. The specific specialty is to treat people that are trapped in a confined space. Teams went out for rescue missions. Um, my responsibility was to make sure that they got the equipment that they needed. Um, and then at the end of the night, I made sure that the equipment came back, was clean and ready for the next team that was gonna come in and work uh, that morning. So I had the day shift, Dave had the night shift. Um, primarily, the task force leader is to supervise, go in, find out what the people, the division or whatever you're working in wants you to do, and then you would go back and discuss that with your rescue teams and you would formulate a plan and you would go do that work. In New York, New York was running the show. New York had divided the, the pile up into s their own divisions. They had a, either a division chief or a deputy chief in charge of each division. By the time they reach the Jacob Javits Convention Center, Task Force 6 has received some devastating news. That FDNY Deputy Fire Chief Raymond M. Downey Sr., founding member of the FEMA Urban Search and Rescue Team Network, and Chief in Charge of Special Operations Command, which includes New York Task Force One, was killed in the collapse of the North Tower. Most of his rescue team perished as well. One of the most decorated firefighters in city history, the 39-year veteran was so revered by his men that they called him God behind his back, knowing it was not a nickname he would embrace. FEMA's operation chief at the Oklahoma City bombings, he was the one man who best understood the unique capabilities of each urban search and rescue task force, including Riverside's Task Force 6. His death creates a leadership void and some early frustrations in FEMA search and rescue operations. The top leadership had died, had died before we got there. These were the people that were the um, truly the leaders of a rescue, urban search and rescue, which made it challenging for us because the people that knew what we could do, knew what we were capable of, they had already died. And the leadership that came in did the best they could, but they didn't fully understand our capabilities and what, and what we could do for them. Some of us have wor had worked with the New York task force and knew some of the guys and a lot of the guys that we knew were killed and I I remember really being affected by that I was at the beginning of USAR when he was bringing this about with a couple of the guys from California he was the grandfather of the FEMA USAR teams um, 
So all of us were so devastated because how do we do this without him? Our task force leader, Dave Lesh, so many people stepped up into positions of leadership there because Ray Downey wasn't there and did a phenomenal job. Every shift we worked at night, there was a different commander from New York City Fire Department that I'd report to. Some understood USAR and what, and what we could do. Others didn't have a clue and didn't even want us there and would kind of like pretty much ignore us. And so that was early eight as we kind of went on, that kind of started to, as they realized what we could bring to the table, what we could help them with, and, and that we were there to help. We weren't there to take over. We weren't there to run their incident. It was like, we're here to help you. I have canines, I have structural engineers, I have doctors, I have search people. I have some very specialized search equipment that can help us find any possible survivors. And once they realized that, then they're like, okay, now they started to open up and they wanted to use us. Had Ray not been killed that morning, I think the whole operation would have been very different. Um, I mean, I, you talk to New York firefighters, who are you? Why are you here? What, what's USAR? They had no idea. And basically, honestly, we negotiated with them what we were going to do. And primary in the negotiations was, you're not to take your people into that pile without New York people with you. We show up, we're wearing military battle dress uniforms, and I, I brought my rescue helmet here. It looks nothing like a fire helmet. So, he, he, you know, they, he, you know who, who are you guys? So here, 9-11 comes, everyone who's familiar with the FEMA response system is gone, and so here's what we're left with, uh, again, looking at uniforms and shoulder patches and going, you're not a firefighter. We've come 3,000 miles with eight aircraft pallets full of specialized equipment. Uh, we have the training and we're doing a bucket brigade. So that was a little frustrating. And it was difficult for New York because firefighters are in yellow. It took us a while to integrate in and gain the trust. As a dog handler, I worked so much. Some of the other guys didn't work so much because the New York guys had to be in. They had to be there, it was their people. They were trying to pull them out. When we first got there, we weren't really accepted because we were the federal government. And, you know, when you start thinking of a large organization like New York City, they never had to ask for help before. They never had to ask for, California, we're, we're used to mutual aid. We all the time have fires and have neighboring agencies coming in and assisting us. New York City never really did that. So who are you, why are you here, and why are you trying to do stuff for us? So within a couple of days, some, some brilliant person on our team came up with, well, why don't, why, don't we, why don't we put our International Association of Firefighter local number on our helmets? So that, that did big things. The attitude towards us, at least on the ground level, um, changed uh, more positively when we at least identified ourselves as firefighters. My best attempt in at a New York accent is like, oh, oh, oh my God, you guys are firefighters? And when they all of a sudden realized we were actually firefighters, it was like, oh, you, you're just like us. But on our side, for the structural people, um, we were sort of universities. Cities have engineering departments, public works departments, stuff like that. But they were more or less relying on us. Um, it was a little bit different for us. We, uh, we were used, you know, routinely. Well, I'll be honest. I, uh, when I was there, uh, I never once took anything personal. Um, yeah, they were standoffish. Yeah, they really weren't welcoming. But I'll be honest, I, I don't blame them. I mean, I can't even put into words what they have, I, I can't imagine. So for me, it, it, never, it never affected me, it never bothered me, I, I understood. They probably didn't want us there because they were gonna get their, their guys out. We weren't, they were. I respected 
every bit of that from them. FDNY was always known as one of the best fire departments in our, in our nation. They were hurting, they were confused, they were upset, they were, um, wanted, wanted to find their brothers. Rescue workers coined the term the pile to describe the 1.8 million tons of wreckage left from the collapse of the World Trade Center. They avoid the use of ground zero, which generally describes the epicenter of a bomb explosion. So I remember one evening uh, I would work the night shift just looking at a guy standing by himself looking out over the pile and I just walked up and gingerly, hey, how's it going? And he had the thousand yard stare and he said, my best friend Jimmy's in there. And so I've never forgotten that. But they were devastated and they, they were very clear, you know, if we find remains of a firefighter, New York guys are bringing them out and we're like, no problem. That's the way it should be. So, you know, you kind of develop your ground rules and you are sensitive to their needs and you, you go with that because you'd want that same thing done to you if they were coming here. The most difficult thing that I experienced was the firefighters who were still around looking for their co-workers. Fathers looking for their sons, there were um, women looking for their children. There were signs um, on the building saying missing. Um, not only was there picture signs and posters, but there was, it was real dusty. So there were people who were writing, I'm looking for Tommy or I'm looking for Jim. Um, and that was very hard to take. My heart goes out to them um, because that, that department went through a tremendous amount of pain. I think one of the things that bothered me more than anything was the people that were outside of the uh, perimeter of looking for their loved ones and it, it just was overwhelming. I mean, it was like, it's very difficult. It really is, it's very hard. If we did find uh, a deceased firefighter, it was FDNY's job to remove it. They wanted that, that assignment, they wanted that honor. So we would do is we would advise them of what we would find, we'd back off, they would come in and they would remove that person with all honors. I bought a patch when I was there. And so I carried this patch in my uniform pocket every single day since I came back. So this is my silent tribute to, to the, the men and women of FDNY. For, so for somebody else to come in, they weren't having it. And I don't blame them. I walked across the street to find these two steel doors with small windows. And I looked inside and the lights were on. And there was no one inside. Told Chief Lesh, you know, I found a place right across the street. It looks clean. It has lights. I think it's going to be a better fit for us. I said, all we need to do is get through these steel doors. And he goes, no problem. So a couple of the firefighters and I walked across the street and uh, there were a few NYPD standing outside. And I looked at them and I said, uh, we're gonna break into this building. And one of the officers goes, Go ahead. So I was amazed how fast the firefighters could get through this steel door. It's like they did it all the time. And they opened the door up in about 30 seconds to a minute. And we walked in and I looked around and I said, well, this is great. It's got light, it's clean, it's not dusty. And around the corner came uh, another individual and he informed us that he was the superintendent of the building and I I told him well we're going to use this as our forward base of operations he said do you know what this building is I said I have no idea 
He said, this is the American Stock Exchange. And I said, okay, now it's our forward base of operations. But over the time that we were there, he was very gracious and we tried not to beat up his building too badly. That's what your logistics guys, that's what you count on them to do. And you know, you come back to this, you walk into this building and it's kind of like, wow, this is kind of not, you know, they've moved everything off to the side. All the cases are stacked up with all your equipment. And you're ready to go to work. Well, we all knew the air quality was terrible. I think one advantage, and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way, but we here deal with wildland fires and deal with smoke and in ways that a lot of people um, probably east of the Mississippi don't. And so we all knew it was bad. We all knew you could smell it, that it was toxic. But I also think that to some degree the, the, the mask for some of the New Yorkers or for the firefighters may have been looked at like us, like, ah, you FEMA guys, it's like, it's almost like a weakness. I think we did the right thing by insisting on masks. We had them, we wore them. Dr. Sanders was emphatic at all of our briefings. You wear a mask, you wear a mask, you wear. And I wore it as much as I could, but you know, as you know, they're hard to talk through. And the New York guys weren't wearing them. The chiefs I were dealing with weren't wearing them. So I'd have to pull it down. Mine was down around my neck a lot. You know, those are some of the issues, the masks, you know, most of our guys were wearing them pretty good. As a leader, I have to admit, I always had the mask on, it just wasn't up here. It most of the time is down around my neck because I'm having to talk to other people and you can't talk through a mask efficiently. Uh, which is probably why I developed pneumonia and asthma when I came back from 9-11. Now, thank goodness, that's pretty much all cleared up and I don't have any right now residual effects from that. I'd say a big thing that he's kind of passed on to us is just taking responsibility for your actions. And whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, you know, if you screwed up, own it, you know, and then move forward with it. Are they safe? Are they okay? Do they need anything? Um, are they being threatened? Um, with cell phones, it's a lot easier. My husband was very um, good at communicating with me. It might be a phone call that says, I'm fine, I've eaten, I've slept some. How are the kids? I love you, I'm praying for you, and that was all we got. But I knew he was okay. As a safety officer, and, and my role as safety officer is the health and safety of our team members. So I knew the air quality was bad. Even before we left Javits Center, I said, we're gonna have to wear respiratory equipment. And I looked at what we had, and we didn't have the proper stuff. This is not gonna, this is gonna hurt us more than it's harmful, so I threw those away. And, and uh, P100 was the highest level of facial respirators you could use. And we didn't have enough. We only had enough for one operational shift. I told them, we need to establish that as, our, as the respirator that we want to use, and we need to get emergency order of them brought out to us. Now, I'm no expert on air quality, but I have a family friend, and he said, in the air, there's going to be asbestos, silica, all other particulate matter, and you have to protect your guys with HEPA filters. My, uh, my father passed from lung disease, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that, that these guys uh, had the protection that they needed. The dust that was in the air, you know, um, th that was probably the, and not only in the air, it was just covering everything. Everything was covered in soot. It took them a while, uh, pretty quickly though, a day or two, to, to actually get the, you know, the half mask with the heap of filters. It didn't have a, a, a way to speak, you know, or whatever. So uh, you had to almost lift it up a little bit, you know, if you wanted to really explain something to someone. Since I am a medical, uh, team manager. Uh, as far as safety goes, I had, uh, 
I had the last word, but I insisted. And, um, and uh, I think it helped. The amount of area that we had to search had to be broken up into quadrants, divisions. And so we were assigned a certain division, which was the church division. Our, our job was to go in and search the voided areas. Part of that assignment and technique is to get under the best we can using um, acoustical devices, listening devices, uh, search cameras, anything we could to search an area. Once we determined that the area was clear, our job was to tag that area with spray paint, putting an X there and indicating who searched that area, CATF6, which would be Riverside City USAR team. When someone um, goes into a building, um, they, they drew a circle or a square and they, and they quadrant it. And basically they have markings to tell if it's been searched, um, if there's um, people in there in danger, if there's some danger due to um, gas leaks, you know, explosion danger, fire danger. So all those markings, and, and at the end of the day, um, if it's clear, you have a marking, it's clear. So if someone's trying to assess, have we searched everything, those markings help them um, see what has been searched and what the danger areas are. I had a lot of support through the other firefighter wives. We would talk regularly and get information, uh, you know, my husband said this and my husband said that, this is what's going on. So we would get information from each other. So we kept constant contact uh, during that time. Um, we're all very close. So we were able to give each other information. And then I would relay that information to his family and my family who were you know, very concerned and I tried to put them at ease as well. Now the, you know, what are we seeing without being too graphic, I never saw a complete um, body. So people are finding pieces of bodies and that's not what, it's not what we're used to on a day-to-day -day basis. And at that point, within the first couple of days, you, you realize that that, that was a, probably the most important thing that we could do, just so that some family members could have some closure. The most gripping part of that for me was when a firefighter's body was located. Everything would stop, everyone would stand at his attention. The, if it wasn't found by FDNY members, uh, they would be summoned to that particular area and then they would be responsible for, uh, for uh, packaging and removing uh, the body and uh, with an American flag draped over them, everyone standing at attention. Everybody had a very personal, emotional reaction to the removal of the remains and the respect, the quiet that went on. People stepped back, went back to their groups. We all went back to our forward base of operations, our boo, and waited until all of that was handled and the remains were taken off because it could have been any of us. Well, by the time we got there and got on site, uh, a lot of the heavy equipment, or big cranes, heavy duty cranes, uh, were there. They were already there. The problem was is to get uh, coordinated with the operators and the people who were in charge of that equipment and you know this is what we're going to need can we get you to help us uh, uh, and work it out with them which is what we were assigned to do. Um, and, and that's when they really had to um, sort of coordinate where they were using the heavy equipment that could move something and you didn't want to have someone doing search and rescue down below that area. Where, where they could shift something and something could fall on someone. So uh, there's a lot of coordination in that. It fell down with such a force that it really uh, meshed all that pretty good. So we're equipped and we're trained, but this is my big testamental. This is my very first employment, and it's the biggest event in the world. You know, we're, I'm working on, on what I have to do to keep my, my men and women safe. So it was a, 
a challenge right off the bat. In the days that followed while he was there, I was glued to the TV. I watched every news channel morning till I went to bed at night just to try and get a glimpse of him or the team. Uh, any news I could get, I was just hungry for it. I, I needed to know. Phone calls were very far and few between, but he always assured me that they were being safe and their training uh, would we'll, we'll get them back home. And I remember one night, a very vivid, <clears throat> excuse me, image for me was standing in the pile and looking down and there was a doll just laying in the debris. It's 36, 48 hours earlier, some child was playing with that doll. You know, and, and not knowing did that child who played that doll, did they survive or not? Were they one of the ones who got out? I'm incredibly proud that he went with his team. He led his team in the best way that he could. Um, and just to go serve and to help people in their time of need, you know, nobody wants to see that kind of carnage and nobody wants to see that kind of loss of life. And even if God were to take him home, on a call or driving to work. I knew if anything happened, I knew it would be a road to walk through, but I knew I didn't have to walk through that by myself. I knew God would walk me through every step. I was standing there thinking, we got two 110-story office buildings. What's in an office building? Desks, couches, chairs, computers, whatever. In the nine days I stood there, never saw a desk, never saw a computer, never saw a couch, never saw a chair, nothing. You wanted to survive 9-11, you had to be a piece of paper. Because there was a cemetery not too far at one of the churches with the old stand-up grave stones. That thing was, most of those gravestones had paper halfway up the, the gravestone. You had to be a piece of paper to survive 9-11. When those buildings fell, everything in them got pulverized, except the paper. And the buildings, you couldn't even recognize them, and all the buildings were damaged around. And we had to walk through this, past other teams, past other people. You think you're in a movie. You think this cannot be real. I cannot be seeing what I'm seeing. You know, there were buildings where some of the windows were broken out. And, and so not only had to worry about what had happened, but if uh, glass coming down, you know. So finally what they did is they, they, they built some scaffolding to sort of protect you as you walked around that area or sit down there. So if something was happening, the glass would come down, it wouldn't hit you, you know. So all those, all those little things um, um, that you don't, normally think as you go along, you say, hey, you know, we better take care of this. There was a smell in the air that was very unique, a, a smoke that was just surrounded us. There were hundreds if not thousands of civilians and firefighters digging in the pile, doing what they can, moving what they can to try to find survivors. Seeing the immense destruction, a horrific scene with swarms of people working on the pile. Uh, sticks in my mind the initial shock of seeing the amount of devastation. It's hard to comprehend the amount of devastation that was there, uh, enormous amount of, of debris everywhere, uh, equipment that was destroyed by the event, uh, just very overwhelming. Yeah. Even though the, the, the two main structures came pretty down, right straight down, um, there are a lot of um, shards that came off that building, hit other buildings, and they were hanging on the buildings. And, and so the first thing is um, they wanted to 
have an assessment, just a brief assessment of the structures, uh, just basically looking at that damage and if it was going to um, inhibit the structural integrity of the structure. Did it damage the foundations, the columns, whatever, an initial assessment. And, and the first thing they do also in the search and rescue, and that's where you see all the markings, they go in and search if anybody got stuck. You know, anybody hurt. In, in all these peripheral buildings, every, every peripheral building had to be searched, you know, floor by floor, you know, room by room, uh, just to make sure no, no one was in there. Um, radio signals get blocked by multitude of buildings, which of course we had in New York. And then we have the challenge of when, when our folks are sent down into the subway, down into the pile and looking for folks, our radios don't work. There's just this mass amount of, of steel and debris that's blocking those radio signals. So it becomes a very dangerous operation for our folks. And we have to try to figure out how to make the radios work in those circumstances. We're asked usually to go in first um, and give an area, and then they narrow down the area once our dog has given an alert. With FEMA, all of our dogs are trained for a bark alert. Um, they bark when the dog's barking, they know they have something. So then we bring in search, our search team manager comes in, we bring in the search group. So we are one clog in the wheel. We are part of a search team, a part of a rescue team. We are the canine portion of that. They're straining at their leash to go. And you go to tell them to go, they leap forward and they start hunting. They don't need any direction from us. And so we can direct them from a distance, either back or left or right, or call them to us if we need them back for safety. So we just work them, cover the area we're asked to cover, and then move on to the next one. And you can move on or you can scrape the next layer. We found nothing. We're gonna step back, we're gonna go search over here and they can start bringing in the equipment um, to pull different layers off. Anybody who's been injured or near the surface has already been rescued. By the time we get there, we're looking for anything below the surface. They don't do that by sight, they do it by smell. And they will hunt and hunt and hunt and not quit until they find the scent we've trained them for. When they get to that scent, they get their reward, which is usually a toy and it's a tug game between the dog and that's how they get their reward. So they love tugging on their toy. When there was a fine made, the, the process was that we would step back and New York would handle um, taking the remains out. And dogs don't get depressed in that sense because they're not, a, they have no emotional attachment to the odor we've given them. It's an odor. They know when they find that odor, they get their toy. So they're gonna keep looking and looking and looking because they want their toy. They don't have an emotional attachment. So a dog doesn't get depressed or upset. They may get frustrated because they did get their toy recently. So if we've searched for a long time and the dogs are getting frustrated because they haven't gotten their reward in a while, then we'll take them away from where we're searching and we'll set a known odor out and let them get a reward. Now that they're back as excited, we'll bring them back in and we'll set them back out and let them search some more. All of our dogs search naked without anything on so they don't get caught and don't get hurt. They're used to that kind of environment with their feet and they have to have the dexterity to be safe on the rubble. For us to put boots on them, we'd have more injuries than not. From all the places I've searched, I've never had a dog injured on their paws. The dogs we choose to do this have to have a very high hunt drive. A dog with the drive that we need to do this work will go off a cliff for that toy. And that's the level of drive that the dogs have to have that work in this environment because as people can see from the pictures of 9-11, it's, it's hell. And to put yourself in that environment, let alone a dog, they have to be incredibly self-confident and comfortable on that surface. You can put any scent on it, 
from human to drugs to IEDs, explosives, you can put any scent on a dog as long as they have the drive. And it's the dog who never gives up, no matter what surface it's on, that's our dog. And those are the ones we choose. So we're all in competition for the same dog. Our, our largest percentage of dogs in search work are labs. Um, and then recently in the past five or years or so, Malinois, Belgian Malinois. Many of our dogs are from rescues or shelters because they were way too much dog. They're not good pets. They're a working dog. Our dogs are our own. We are um, their owners. The task forces don't own our dogs. For us, they're our pets. It's a different kind of pet than, you know, your house dog. Most of them um, are very high energy. Most of the time the dogs are kenneled, my dogs for safety are kenneled during the day when I'm at work. We, you know, go for hikes or walks in the evening and they're part of my home. They, they live um, inside with me. Many dogs are fabulous pets, but very few. One out of a hundred makes this dog. Having seen the live television of the, of the buildings coming down, I was a, a bit skeptical that we'd find very many people alive. It was just the, the amount of energy and destruction. I would have been surprised if anyone was found alive. Your mindset and you're looking at that when I first got there is like, how can anyone survive? And you still have that hope because you're there to rescue, that, that's what you've trained for, you want to rescue people. And, but within a you know, few days you start realizing, you know, most of the people who survived this are already out. And at that point I took my my rescue team manager aside and the squad leaders aside and kind of talked to them and said, okay, look, we know we're in recovery mode. When your family have lost someone they love, they don't want to hear that word, recovery. They want to hear rescue and search because they're, they're still holding out hope upon hope that their loved one, by some miracle, has survived. Nobody was finding anybody. We're trained to find people alive in void spaces and then to get there and then fairly quickly realize that that wasn't going to be the case was a very hard uh, pill to swallow. And so then it's, it's just, you know, getting the guys realize, okay, look, it, recovery is a very important function. It brings closure. For the families who've lost someone, to recover their loved one brings closure for that family. And so that's, it's important mode. It's not, it's not a second rate mission. It's not something that, you know, we've trained for this too. Yes, we all want to rescue that person and bring them out alive. That is what we have spent all our time and energy to do all the training we had so we could do that. But recovery is just as important to be able to bring, bring closure. And also importantly, when that is changing the mindset, okay, if I know I'm going in for a live person, like say on a structure fire, you have the report of a child that's alive in a bedroom. I'm gonna take certain risks to get in there to get that child. Risks I'm not gonna take if I know the child's already dead. And, and so you have to get your guys and the team to, okay, you gotta get around that concept that we're in recovery mode now. We don't want you to be one of the ones who recover. So slow down. There was a lot of death. There was a lot of tragedy. There was a lot of danger. Even for some of the firefighters, the psychological strain of being on that rubble pile was tremendous. And you could see it in their faces. All the task member teams, I think, were deeply affected and frustrated by the fact that here's 3,000 individuals. We want to save them all, but we're saving none. Psychologically challenging. Ghastly images, sounds, and smells can play tricks on the mind. 
but seeking psychological help presents its own special set of challenges. What our rescuers were finding were um, horrible things, horrible things. The mind starts, you know, I mean, the, the, you know, the carnage was on, you know, on, on, on my mind for sure. You know, I didn't know how I would handle that. It's the um, apprehension of, of things. I can close my eyes. I can still see those images. I can still smell the smells. I can hear the, the, the sounds. And some of those images are not good images. Uh, they're ones I haven't shared with hardly anybody ever. And then every year when 9-11 comes around, it's more in the forefront. I wasn't able to obviously go with the USAR team from California, but spending 20 years in the fire service, I knew a lot of the members of the team that went back there. I spent a total of 16 days at Ground Zero on two separate occasions, eight day trips each. And uh, I took lay counselors from our church on both those trips. When I came back from uh, New York City, I recognized immediately that I was not equipped to minister to those people uh, as they deserved. There were so many other uh, areas that I needed to be trained up in, and so I ended up sending myself across the United States taking classes in what they call critical incident stress management. People really didn't, I think especially at that time, want to be that guy that would be seen or could be seen as a weakness and somebody that you couldn't somebody that could not be relied upon, maybe couldn't handle it. And so that all ties into why people don't say anything or reach out for, for help. Um, you really just, you didn't, you didn't want the, the guys to think that you were weak. They feel like they become a liability, they go on light duty, they're not important, they're gonna get retired, they're gonna leave the career, have to leave the career that they love. So they shut up and they don't say anything. They don't seek help. It goes on every day, whether in New York or every fire department across the nation, in workers' comp, mental, whatever. Nobody wants to be hurt. When we came back from 9-11, we required everyone to go through one debriefing meeting that we had, Some brought some crisis people in. When we came back, you know, the critical incident stress debriefing was, was offered. And again, it's no one's going to sit around a room and like, okay, who's going to go first? There's just a mistrust that there's nobody else who could understand, you know, what we have experienced, what we've done. And yeah, it's hard. In the fire service and the police department, we're, we're macho. To say you're weak, to say you're having emotional issues, is hard. And for most of us, it's a, it's a dual thing. It's, if you've never seen what I've seen, I don't care if you're a psychologist, how can you even start to understand what I'm talking about? But I used to always tell, as the captain, I'd tell my crew, you know, you need to talk. Now, in the fire station, the nice thing about in the fire station, we did talk. Having my dad being a firefighter and now me being a, a police officer, so it's nice that I can go to him because, you know, we, we might be on different sides of the coin, but he's, he's experienced similar things. So there's, you don't have to, I don't have to keep up the air of bravado and macho, you know, everything's fine. I can go and be real. This was hard. And that really helps. We go to each other. Just like if we're in a combat scene. You go to your, 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 your comrade there in, in the trenches with you. That's where you go. The first, first 10 years, I thought about it all the time, dreamed about it a few times. It's less now. Uh, I, I, I don't feel I really let go of everything yet. They deal with so much uh, chaos in their life each and every day uh, from the, and, 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 and crisis each and every day from the things that they respond to. And when you enter into their life, uh, you have to remember number one, you know, not only the crisis that they are experiencing right then and there, 
but they themselves are already in crisis. 75% of those people you enter into, they're already in a crisis of one kind or another. This is just adding on top of what they personally are experiencing. Uh, even today, there is still some stigma of doing that, getting help from others. I don't mind saying that um, I've done that. I've, I've had to do it, but I didn't recognize it even in me. It took my wife to share with me that I was being different. Admitting that we are struggling is, is just not generally in our nature. We don't want the stigma of that. I don't have a good excuse for it, but it certainly doesn't seem like a sign of strength. A gentleman that I worked with, uh, and he, he was very upset because we had come close to uh, removing one of the uh, firefighters from the site. And uh, between him and I, uh, since we had known each other previously and, and uh, had a good relationship, um, just by talking to each other, we just, I don't know, it was, it was hard. It was hard for him and it was hard for me. And uh, I think that helped a lot. I had the opportunity to approach many NYPD. Even though I was 20 years in the fire service, every time I tried to approach an FDNY, they weren't, they weren't ready because they were still, if you will, they were still in operational mode. What they want, even if they were taking a break, they didn't want to be in that, kent, that tent taking a break. You know where they wanted to be? They wanted to be back on the rubble, you know, and do some more search and rescue and hopefully find somebody. So they weren't out of operational mode. It's a ministry of presence, it's a ministry of compassion, and it's a ministry of silence. Someone once said, the ability to speak several languages is valuable, but the ability to keep your mouth shut in any language is priceless. Most people didn't want to hear about God at that time. You know why? Because they're angry at God. Why would something like this occur in the first place? The aspect of mental health, fortunately, is uh, a rising trend in the fire service, and I think it's one that needed to be addressed. And whether it's it's one major catastrophic traumatic incident or whether it's a thousand over 30 years, you know, they can have the same effect. Some people I think it took years to come back from if they did. Some people didn't come back. They couldn't deal with it. This was not what they signed up for. The hardest part is going home with the job not finished. And it took me a couple of deployments to really understand that, that that's what I was struggling with. I wanted to finish it. It took me a while to, to come to grips with it. Um, I'm not a fan of September, but I do realize that it's something that I need to recognize. And my family and, and especially my wife helped me through some, some tough times. When he came home from 9-11, uh, there was a lot of emotions. Uh, he was, he, he was different. Um, it was a, a happy occasion for, in one sense, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, we cried together. We cried for the people that he couldn't help, that the team couldn't help. Uh, we cried for the whole, it was the whole country. I had to be strong the whole 11 days we were gone because I was a leader. When I got home, I fell apart because then all that emotion just came up and out, you know, in, in one time. Uh, for me, my, my faith plays a big, large portion of my life. It's, it's probably it's the number one most important portion of my life is my faith in God and Christ. So with that, I was able to deal a little bit with the emotional stuff back there. They're there to help people, and they're there to serve people. And I think that sometimes that that's what gets missed, is that really, for the most part, firefighters are servants. For my husband specifically, I think it's his faith and his passion. 
his passion to be a servant, to be different, to make a difference for somebody else. If dad was gonna come home, he was gonna come home. If it wasn't meant to be, it wasn't meant to be. Um, and that, that trust in God, that faith, uh, made it easier. Um, so obviously super proud of who my dad is. Um, he's a great father, he's a great, fire, he was a great firefighter, great chief, captain. Um, just the willingness to go help other people in their time of need. The hope that they're looking for at that moment is, just tell me that I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna remain stuck here forever. Just tell me that my life will eventually be able to move forward. There was a bigger picture than just rescue. It was a time where our country came together um, just for a common cause. Uh, and there was more to the World Trade Center incident. Rescue was a big part of it, but then it became um, a point where we're just coming together as a nation to mourn. Amidst the gloom of their colorless world, they realize that they are also surrounded by some of the best of humanity, and their spirits are lifted by those who care not only for the innocent and the brave who have vanished, but also for them. The city of New York and the people of New York were outstanding. When we were going to or coming back from, the, from Ground Zero, as we entered the Javits Center or departed the Javits Center, there were always people lining along the roads with signs. You know, there was a lot of positive things. I remember the first night going in uh, on, on the 13th. We were driving in, our bus broke down. We got another bus, we got a flatbed truck. I'm in the back of a flatbed truck. We're driving down the streets of New York City and they're lined with people, throwing us water bottles, throwing us candy bars, holding up signs, thanking us for coming. Uh, and, and those type of things, I mean, it, it made you feel good. People lined, lined the road, they were clapping, they were cheering us. Um, it, it, it was just heartwarming to see you know, the, the, that reception. No matter if we were coming or going, there was always crowds cheering us. I figured, never having been to New York, I'll just walk back from the World Trade Center to the Javits Center. How far could it be? And within about five minutes, I was lost. The, um, the Army was there, and I remember a um, NYPD Suburban. I jumped in the jumped in the back, and the nicest police officers turned to me and they said, "Where are you going, Doc?" I said, "Well, I, I'm just trying to get back to the Javits Center." I says, "No problem." So we started driving in New York traffic, and as soon as we got out of the perimeter, traffic got. Uh, heavier. And I remember the one officer in the passenger seat turned to the other officer, said, I'll never forget this, Joey, turn on the siren for the doctor. And I said, no, please, I'm just trying to get back to the Javits Center to get something to eat. The siren goes on. The officer that's driving is honking to get us through traffic. And the other officer in the passenger seat turns around and looks at me and he says, don't worry, we do this all the time. I got out and I saw them pull away and turn the siren <laughs> and go about their business. Unbelievable. You know, we were Americans on 9-11. We were united 
as, as Americans on 9-12 for sure. I had a chance to talk to other people throughout the incident and uh, one, one gal reminded me of Jean Stapleton from All in the Family from back in the day. And she, she had commented on, you know, driving in New York and how people were just overly polite coming to a four-way stop and, you know, oh, you go, no, no, you go. And then, you know, my best uh, impression of that, she's like, it's not always like that. There was this woman who suddenly appeared in our forward base of operation. I had no idea who she was. She must have been someone because she's inside the perimeter. There was an angel who, who was from the area. She brought us cots. She brought us food. 20 or 30 boot dryers showed up. Uh, I don't know where they came from. I know our guardian angel coordinated it. From California, I, don't, I never knew that there was these boot warmers. But those are things that she, she would bring to us, kind of like a mom, and, and took care of all of us. She came every day um, to make sure that we were all right. Within a couple of days, I, you know, I think we had like 80 or 100 uh, aero mattresses, aero bed mattresses that, that just showed up. She was an angel. She personified all of the people of New York. She listened to our needs, and whatever needs we had, somehow she made them magically appear. I don't know how she did it, but she was there. Every evening at shift change, she was there. Uh, unbelievable. I thought to myself, I need to do something, I need to help. And I felt this incredible calling and I felt like it was from God. It was like, you have to do something. So I called all the people at my church and I said, we need water. We need supplies, things they might need. And they gave it, they brought it. And so I packed my car up on the 12th. And on the 13th, I headed down to to what became Ground Zero with my children. There was a trailer and manned by all sorts of policemen. And at that moment, someone from what I learned was Task Force 6 in Riverside, California, came out running and he said, we need supplies. Got back in the car with all the stuff and the uh, search and rescue gentleman from Task Force 6. And we arrived at the Dolphin Gym and we unloaded the truck. And I, I looked at them, I said, what do you need? Blanche from Connecticut, you know, coming out. So helpful, you know, and bringing us stuff and doing things for us. You know, basically she was just asking us, what do you need? All these things were delivered to my house by church members. And at the crack of dawn, I would, I filled up the car and went down and gave it to the men, they unpacked them. And it was like a miracle appeared for them. I was the only private car on site. I would park outside the gym. I would see what everybody needed, what they were doing. And then I would go and get it. And she was basically taken in to our, by our USAR team. And uh, we, we really appreciated all the things she did for us. They took me in like I was one of them, like I belonged to them. All I wanted to do was make an impact, make them happy, make them comfortable. We all did something special because we all cared about each other. Everybody pulled together. I don't think I'll ever forget Blanche because there was nobody else like Blanche. Just up on the corner, uh, there was a um, fast food burger place that the windows had been blown out. 
group of people went in there, fired up the grills, and they were making food for the responders. Anyone could come in, walk right off the pile, grab some food and something to drink, maybe take a five minute break, and be right back at it. The team understands early on that effective leadership will depend upon trusting its people and allowing them to do their job. I actually was in charge of the program as a division chief. Dave Lesh was a captain who worked for me that actually managed and ran the program. And we ended up being the two task force leaders. I didn't get involved with the USAR program until I got promoted and was given the assignment to, to manage the team. And I knew, I knew Dave Lesh was my guy. And I told him all the time, you know, it might say I'm in charge, but you're really in charge. I couldn't have, I could not have done this without him. And I've, I've, told him, I've told him that many, many times. Uh, one of the things I learned greatly from Dave, he knew he wasn't from the rescue side and he allowed me to run the team. He was good enough in management and, and he let us run it. He was ultimately in charge at that time. And, and that, that was instrumental to me in learning management, like to realize, okay, when I become a chief, to be the same way, to, to trust my people. The people are the most important piece of this. And nothing can get done without good people, people that feel like you care for them, that you're there for them, and that you'll do what you need to do to make it right, whatever it is. And, and you'll stick your neck out for them. When people see that, they follow. Um, but I also know that I'm a hero to some and a zero to a lot of people. And I accept that. And there's nothing, there's no, there's no real way around that for me. The importance to, to stand up and not be afraid to take responsibility for your job. How difficult it was for, for my fellow chiefs, Chief Flash, Chief Austin, to lead us in a disaster. This is not ordinary, this is extraordinary. Dave Lesh has that innate ability to work with people and yet take charge. That's somebody who can step into a void with the loss of Ray Downey and help orchestrate and lead the whole search effort, boy, he really stepped up during that and became um, the leader that he ultimately was seen as. I would hope I'd be remembered as someone who cared about the people who worked for me and who, that I tried to mentor them. And I would hope I'd be remembered for making a difference, and, uh, and that, that'd be what I'd, I'd want to be remembered for, is that, that, that I made a difference in, in the things I did, in the efforts I put in, that it made a difference in the fire department, in the USAR program, in, in whatever, in just life in general. You know, obviously, to be willing as a firefighter to run into a burning building for even the possible chance of, if somebody's in there, to save somebody, or even just to save somebody else's livelihood is just astounding. There is a lot of strength and a lot of passion, but there is also that soft side of control. I don't think I've ever seen my husband lose his temper ever. There is always that desire that I'm going to leave the situation better than when I found it. You know, for me personally, just is the best dad you could ask for. Uh, a leader I, from fire to our church um, at home, he was always a leader. Always leading, but letting us make decisions at the same time. Um, just being someone that you would want to be. I don't really speak about 9-11 often or what the team has done. When they deploy, those that get the opportunity, because not many do, they see it. You really are your own group, your own team. You really understand what it means to be California Task Force Six. 
I learned to be more compassionate with with people and and truly try to feel their pain, if you will. It's very important to remember 9-11. The entire country needs to not forget. That was the worst tragedy that ever occurred in the United States. The people that were um, killed in that event were um, innocent people. They should be remembered. In fact, I can show you right here that on my wrist is a memorial bracelet for a firefighter uh, named Joe Spohr, FDNY Rescue 3, that I um, happened to assist in finding his helmet and his turnout jacket. I wear this whenever I talk about Joe or, Joe, or I wear it in September on 9-11. These people died and they had no chance and they were innocent and they should always be remembered. We should never forget. I'll say firefighters have a passion and desire to make a difference. For you to call 911 and four people show up on you probably the worst day of your life and they want to help you. They're the helpers. They're the people that the whole of their life stepped in. They didn't step back. They ran towards fire, they ran towards accidents, they ran towards disaster. They're not the ones who scream and run away. The horrors and things that go on on a daily basis, almost. With all that's going on in the world, it's not gonna get easier. And if it's not gonna get easier, then we're gonna have to work together. I think for me and my perspective, thinking of my family and from the, the, my position is, we, we need to come together as a society. As a kid, I wanted to be a fireman. You see the firemen going down, a fire truck going down with firefighters responding to setting up a call. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I hope that people say, you know, say a quick prayer for those individuals and say, keep safe because you're important to our community. Did they go into burning buildings? You know, I mean, <laughs> where other people are running out of buildings, you know, that are, are on fire or collapsing, they run in. I mean, j just like at 9-11, you know, that all the local fire, they were charging up the building. Um, sometimes you forget. We work in life and death situations. And for the public to understand that we will do anything we can to support them and in their time of need. Firefighters in general are very giving, helping people. They would be there on your worst day. They're there for you. I was very proud that my husband went to New York. I was proud of him. I was proud of the entire team. They all want to um, be there and help people. When we are alerted and Chief McKinster puts out the notification, you have to respond within a very short time frame. And for those that respond, if they can, if they're ready for an activation or deployment, it's just a yes. Are you ready? They don't know what the activation or where the incident is at. It's just, are you ready? And to see those responses come in with a why and yes, I'm ready. And yes, I'm ready. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm ready to do what you need to have done. I, I thank God for these, these men and women, these men and women that are willing to uh, walk down dark alleys that you and I would never even think about going down. You know, uh, these men and women that are willing to put their life on the line, you know, for people they don't even know. I just wish that our communities and the people wouldn't forget because they do, they do this for everybody. We do this for everybody every day, every day. Task force members reflect on a lifetime of service and offer up some observations that they have gleaned through the years. Our country was attacked. Many, many people died. If we don't realize the impact that that has had on so many people and so many families in our country. We're gonna focus on so many negative things that we're not gonna recognize the positive things 
we're not going to recognize the positive things in people, the good things that we have in ourselves. People don't realize that in my childhood and in my life, I didn't learn to read until I was much older. I was picked on, I was brought down, I was affected by this stuff as a kid. But I never gave up. And that was the best lesson for me in my life because what I learned is that you just have to work hard and you can't give up. When I talk to the young people, I make sure that I tell them that they're worth something, they're valuable, and they're, they're critically important to, to our future. They're the next ones that they feel from me that, that they're important. Because I just feel that people need to know that they're worth something. And I, I've done a lot of school presentations and talked to, and I usually have always tried to tie in, talk about 9-11 to the idea of service, is we're here for more than just ourselves. And regardless of what your career is, mine happened to be a career of service, but no matter what career you choose, you can still serve others. And to have that mindset, to look for opportunities to serve and to serve others, and to make a difference in someone else's life, a positive difference. And if you can do that, then you're gonna be successful in life no matter what you do. Task Force Six has been away from home for 11 days now and have spent eight of them working the pile. It is time to go home and Riverside, California stands ready with open arms and a warm embrace. Even though we had uh, gone to New York on a military transport. All of that transport had been taken up and we returned on a civilian airliner. We were the only people on that airliner. We filled it up. The pilots of that airliner, out of respect, flew with the cockpit door open. Gestures like that really, really affect me. It was always exciting when Dad came home because, you know, we were fairly used to with his, you know, working 24 on, 24 off, or whatever his shift was. So we were kind of used to Dad not always being around, and that's just the way it was. You know, I remember when he, specifically when he came home from 9-11, it was down at his office building. They had the warehouse where they had all their California Task Force stuff. Um, and they had the big fire trucks and the ladders with the flag hanging down and tons of different people, either from the department, other families, everybody was just kind of there. Uh, and it's just, you know, it's always exciting when Dad comes home. Everyone treated them like a hero's homecoming, but to them, it's their job. It's what they do. It's what they love to do. We landed at March Air Force Base and um, got on a bus, uh, returned to the fire station, and uh, all our families were there with signs and uh, and uh, waving. You know, the families were there waiting for us. You know, um, it, it, um, it, 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 it was just good because everybody was exhausted. It's just good to, 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 to see, you know, loving arms, loving eyes. From a 26-year-old perspective, you know, you're just getting through it. You don't understand all the pieces of what family means, what kids are. But as you grow, you, you learn and you evolve. And you know, you have your own family and you really begin to realize what it meant for some of those people. And then as I became a program manager, I met a lot of them. I feel very proud that I was able to assist in an event of that magnitude. It's something that I've trained for uh, almost my entire career in the fire service, uh, that of helping people, those in need, 
We all would have loved to come back and say we had rescued hundreds of people. And the reality is we didn't. We didn't rescue anyone. They had all been rescued before we got there. But we did bring closure. We, we helped New York City Fire and Police and New York City itself bring closure to a horrific incident. And those are things that, I, you know, that are the good emotions. I got, found myself right back into work again, getting back in to try to move on. It was time to move on. And um, I think sometimes we dwell too much on stuff. And that kind of goes back to the mental stuff, mental um, health issues. You got to move on. I still remember coming back and uh, seeing my wife and kids waiting for me. It was uh, a whole new perspective. And uh, hopefully I've carried that forward. Their journey of service really never ends. And they would have it no other way.
None of us will ever forget this day. Yet we go forward to defend freedom and all that is good and just in our world. Six Avenue to Five Avenue. High Field leading the base. Madame the 6th Battalion.